I wanted to talk with you about a couple of things that came out. Well, first of all, one thing that came out last night in our Bible study that uh, was made clear um, yesterday, we were reading from Revelation 8 and 9. Revelation 8 talks about trumpets 1 through 4, and then Revelation 9 talks about trumpets 5 through 6. And you know that trumpets 1 through 4 are those trumpets that are happening while the witnesses are here. And the function that those trumpets are serving, remember that God established trumpets in order to call the community in or send the community out. Call them in, send them out. The silver trumpets, remember those that he taught Moses about? Call the community in or send them out. The purpose that those trumpets are serving, numbers one through four, those are being blown while the witnesses are here. So the witnesses are calling you into repentance. There's three things God's doing. He's calling you into repentance with those trumpets because that's part of your covenant. When you see these that these things are happening, anything that's happening, not just the things that are listed in Revelation 8, but when you see that God is harming the earth, when you see that he's harming you, you're supposed to recognize that he's calling you in. And so as those things are happening, those who are responding to God, he says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves return to me, seek my face, then I'll heal them and I'll heal their land. So one thing he's doing is he's harming the land. Another thing he's doing is harming you, maybe through your body, maybe through, you know, what we're calling mental disorders, emotional stuff. All of it is spiritual. That's why I say what we're calling, what is manifesting as emotional disorders or physical disorders or mental disorders. All of this is spiritual. All of this has a purpose and is manifesting your spiritual and emotional condition. That's what God's using to call you back. That was the agreement he made with his people. When you see that I'm doing this, when you see that I'm doing that, I won't put on you any of the diseases that I put on the Egyptians if you obey me. I am the Lord who heals you. So he's the Lord who puts those things on you and he's also the Lord who heals you. He is the Lord who created this earth and he's also the one who harms the earth. He's the one who sends destruction. He's the one who sends prosperity. He's the one who created good. And he's also the one who created evil. Now, one of the things that you will find as you've been listening to the revelation, the revelation eight and nine videos, or you were in the Bible study is that God has referred to us as land, Jerusalem, Jerusalem is seen as a bride, beautifully dressed for, for her husband coming out of the sky. You have been referred to as trees, a flourishing olive tree, a wild olive tree, and a natural olive tree. The wild olive tree is engrafted into the natural olive tree. You have been referred to as the sea or waters, peoples, multitudes, languages, and nations. You've been referred to as the light of the world, and he's been building your lampstand on which to place his light. You carry his light. You carry the Holy Spirit. And so as we're looking at these different trumpets, trumpets... One through four, he's talking about his people. Those trumpets are actually separating the wheat from the tares. So when he sends those trumpets, those who return to him are in him. Those are his people. Those who do not are not. And there's death happening. And there's, they're being, the land is being burned up. And a third of the waters are dying. And a third of the waters are becoming bitter. And the light in trumpet number four is going out. Now let's take a look at that just from a mathematical perspective, okay? You have a group of people and in the first trumpet, a third of the earth is burned up. So a third of the land, a third of the trees, a third of the grass, a third of that group is burned up. And then what's left is two thirds. And now a third of that turns to blood. And then a third of that, what remains, turns bitter, dies from bitter water. And then a third of that, the light goes out. Do you remember what happened to King Saul? Because he had the spirit of God at one time, but he kept spurning God. He kept turning away from him. He wasn't listening to the spirit of God. So he was grieving the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit left him and he was replaced with a spirit of torment. So you could have the Holy Spirit right now, but that could be replaced very quickly with a spirit of torment. And now you're no longer the light of the world. Now the light in you is darkness. And so in the fourth trumpet, you see that a third of the light, a third of the day is without light and a third of the night. That was one revelation that Unique brought up. And, uh, you know, as she started to talk about it, it was like something very cool is happening. Okay. So I, it used to be that I was doing this like alone with God. 
And now I'm seeing him activate people. I'm seeing that Unique is getting things. I'm seeing that Sarah is starting to talk up, you know, speak up. And she's speaking pure truth. And I'm seeing Norma talking and she's sharing her experience. And I'm seeing Connie, you know, God is moving her to see certain things in scripture and put in and understand how they go together. And so what God is doing is he's testifying now and bringing unity between us by testifying to the work and also by testifying to what is being said, to what's being revealed to us individually and bringing it together in unity. It's such a cool thing. So Unique started talking about this in Bible study and immediately I knew exactly what was going on because the Holy Spirit was ministering to me. And I'm sure that was happening to others in, in the group. And then Connie and I had a, had a post Bible study, Bible study this morning because God was showing, d- directing her to other scriptures. It's just the coolest thing ever. He's speaking into our experiences. He's speaking into his word. And these are the things he uses. Spirit, testimony, word. And then he brings his people together in unity. And uh, Connie said something really interesting today that I th- I thought was, yeah, absolutely. That's completely true. She said, it reminds me of, um, you know, when God says that on the testimony of two or more. So he's bringing together witnesses to testify to what he's speaking to us collectively, individually and collectively. It's really awesome. And there's some others who have talked with me sort of on the side, but since they've talked with me on the side, I'm not going to mention what they've said because, you know, maybe they wanted it. They, they, they didn't really want, they're not ready to be known in the group yet. But this is just really exciting. So I had said in previous videos, you know, I think this might be at face value, valid, but I also had said, I, I just didn't really feel like it was all just face valid. I just felt like God hadn't revealed it to me yet. And I believe that the reason he hadn't revealed it to me is because he wanted to reveal his glory doing that together with all of us. That trumpet number four is referring to, I I always kind of knew that it was referring to the light of the world, but I was like, didn't understand quite how that went. But the minute he, you know, sort of removed that, whatever the block was and revealed it to me, you know, we can't understand until God makes us understand then it's clear as day. It's like, oh yeah, of course. And he reminded me of King Saul and how that, you know, the spirit goes out of King Saul. That's what happens. And so let me tell you something. If you're lukewarm right now, you are at risk of being harvested in the pile for destruction, to be thrown into the fire. If you have lukewarm areas of your life, you are at risk during that fourth trumpet. We are going through the third trumpet right now or approaching it, and I believe something's going to happen. I believe that the holy days are going to be extremely important from here on out. I do actually feel a buildup of something for Passover during that period of Passover, because remember that the witnesses have been working now for nine months, just past our nine-month mark, and so there's we're giving birth to something right now, okay? And Passover is incredibly important to God. Okay, so I have to tell you something, that something really weird just happened with my technology right now. So I have a feeling that this is very important because my app just failed. I couldn't get back into the video. Here I'm talking about Passover. And and I want to tell you something else that God reminded me of is that this is exactly what he wanted in good order in worship. What did he want? Someone speaks a word, another edifies, another prophesies. The church is supposed to be coming together and doing this together, being brought into unity and understanding what God is doing together. That's what's happening right now. And that's an amazing thing because only God can do that. And I got to tell you, that's one of the reasons why I'm such a stickler on people, you know, people speaking correctly and not bringing chaos and confusion and disruption to this channel. That's why I'm a, such a stickler on that, that this is exclusive. This is not inclusive because when you start having people do that, you don't get to have unity. You don't get to be sharing a word of what God is sharing with you and bringing your individual gifts. Cause you got one person that's being allowed to just make things chaotic. So I'm going to keep doing things the way that God has told me to do it. And I am so excited because we are really getting to see the glory of God 
in a true group of true worshipers, and I don't care if it's only seven people or however many people we have now, who cares? It's real. And that's also the luxury of not serving God in money is that it's real. You don't have to try to make it inclusive in order to get some sort of a paycheck. It's inclusive to those who really want truth and are holding themselves accountable to speaking in truth. But I do want to tell you, I want you to hear this, that if you are lukewarm, if you are being reproved, if you are being convicted about certain things that you're doing, you need to receive it right now. Because I don't know when that fourth trumpet is blowing. I believe that God has revealed that the third trumpet is blowing. I believe that that was also confirmed with some of the things that Unique and Connie are talking about receiving from God. So if that's the case, it doesn't necessarily mean that the fourth trumpet is going to somehow blow at the end of the three and a half years that the witnesses are testifying. That's kind of a scary thing. That means it could blow qu pretty quickly whenever he wants, as a matter of fact. And so if there are those of you who have things that you're like, oh, I'm kind of on the fence, you're not being careful about the people you're hanging out with and receiving from and mixing up your doctrine, you're not being careful about the people you're listening to, you're not discerning by the Holy Spirit, you're not receiving those approvals, how much more time do you think you have? You don't. You don't have much time at all. And for that reason, God tells me, move on and move on quickly. If people are not concerned about truth, they're adding to the scroll, trying to combine paganism with Christianity. Be careful of that. Your heart's being tested right now. That's the bottom line. That's what you need to know. As these trumpets have been blowing, your heart is being tested. And those of us have, who've been on the channel for a while, well, obviously I've been on the channel since day one, but those of you who've been on the channel for a while, you've seen people fall. You've seen that happen. You've seen them being thrown into a different group, haven't you? You've watched those who are lukewarm and you are realizing just how small that group is of those who are chosen versus those who were called. We have to be so careful, myself included, so careful. So if he is reproving you, if he's disciplining you, if he is rebuking you, you receive it, just receive it. So that's part of what's going on in these trumpets. And that's the clarification of what's going on in the fourth trumpet. And it makes total sense, doesn't it? So God is burning up, burning up the land, a third of the land in trumpet number one, a third of the water, or C in trumpet number two turns into blood. Trumpet number three, a third die from the living, excuse me, from the uh, wormwood, the star called wormwood, that bitter substance. And by trumpet number four, he's real clear. You have lost the light that he gave you. And so one of the things that Connie said, and this was on my heart as well, is the church in Laodicea when he says, uh, you know, you're lukewarm. I wish you'd choose whether you're going to be hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. What has God been warning about? He's been warning. He warned in, in uh, Revelation 2 and 3 to these various churches. He said specifically, these are the things I'm holding against you. So what is he now doing in trumpets? Well, he's putting it into practice. You've had this amount of time to get it together. I sent you prophets. I sent you witnesses. You're out. Do you know how serious that is? Listen, I've given it. Every one of you extended an invitation to every one of you to be in the Bible study, to do the workshop, to ask me questions, to email me. We can set up a time on the phone. I'll do a video for you. I have extended myself completely in the ways that God has told me to do it. And you know how few people we have in the workshop compared to how many people are on the channel? There's 494 people on the channel as of right now. We got about 15 people invited to the workshop. Not all participate, not all show up. Excuse me, I'm talking about the Bible study. I think I said the workshop. And then the workshop only has, well, I don't know how many people do we have now, six or something like that. A couple who are adding on right now, but have had some technology issues. The fact that people are not taking me up on this really is a concern for me because I know that there's no healing and I know there's such a desperate need for healing right now in this world, specifically in God's church. Why? Why is it that? Why is that the case, guys? Think about that. Are you making the time? Or do you have excuses? You white-knuckling it? You deciding, oh, I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. This is the most important thing you're doing right now. So I just want to put that little, little bit of pressure on you in love. But it's the truth. So Connie called me this morning. And like I said, we had a post-Bible study for the Bible study. <laughs> or post-Bible study, Bible study. And she was sharing with me some scriptures that God had been putting on her heart. So I want to share them with you, and then there's some others that, that God's put on my heart since then. 
And it's really regarding this third trumpet. And it's interesting that he's drawing her attention as well to the third trumpet, because that's the one I've been telling you that I believe he's building up. Either he started blowing it or he's building up to blowing it. I, I don't know for sure. But I definitely feel that more is coming. I can tell you that. And I, and I believe that Passover is going to be very important. And that makes sense because he passes over those who are pulling on him. So this would be a way that he's speaking to us, particularly at this time in history, because they're pulling on him, because they're preparing to enter into Passover. They're being prepared by the witnesses to enter into Passover. They're reading his word. Returning to him, some of you will be celebrating Passover for the first time ever, like ever. And a lot of you were raised in so-called Christianity, counterfeit Christianity. Why were you never taught to celebrate Passover? I wasn't either. We were getting dressed up and, you know, going on Easter egg hunts. What does that have to do with the most important gift that we've been given in our entire existence? Now, remember his first Passover. Remember that the Israelites were told to sacrifice that lamb Put the blood of the lamb over the door, of course, representing the blood of Christ and the seal that we've been sealed with if we're in him. So, of course, he's going to bring something big. This is the first Passover since the witnesses have started testifying, since you guys have been rounded in, pulled into him. And you've seen what he's been doing this last year. He's been pulling people out of Babylon, pulling Babylon out of them. You're being built. You're being prepared for something right now. So it makes sense, this curse that's going out that I've talked to you about in Zechariah 5. I told you that in Zechariah 5, he talks about a curse that's going to go into the houses of all those who f swear falsely in his name. Well, doesn't that bring the whole theme together? I mean, that's what these people have been doing who are getting, who are spiritually dying in trumpet number one, trumpet number two. Now again, trumpet number three. And the waters are turning bitter from that star that has fallen, that wormwood star, and the people drinking of those waters are dying. And you know that waters are people's multitudes and languages and nations. So that's kind of an interesting way to say it, isn't it? Like they're drinking of the people's multitudes, languages and nations are drinking of the people's multitudes, languages and nations. Yeah. The false teachers, the false prophets. No surprise that the false prophets have been up in the ante, huh? No surprise that revival has been happening. Jonathan Kahn's book came out in which he's, you know, exalting and elevating the gods, whatever they are, they're nothing, making everyone scared, making everyone focus on counterfeit Christian teachings. No surprise that you, you should be looking at what you're seeing in scripture, what God is moving you to understand and looking at what is going on in the world right now. These are bitter waters. These are representing adultery to the world, even though they call it Christianity, it is adultery. It is pagan Christianity, counterfeit Christianity. That's what they're pulling on. That's what they believe. That's what they're betting their life on. Swearing falsely in his name, pretending like those revivals are somehow being, you know, happening by the Holy Spirit, but yet there's no evidence of the Holy Spirit being there. None. Just a bunch of people trying to make something up. It's fake and phony, and I don't see the Holy Spirit there because usually when the Holy Spirit rounds his people up, he pours out and you see evidence of his gifts. I don't see that. I see a bunch of delusional people, but you know where I see it? I see it in our Bible study. I see the Holy Spirit moving there because he's testifying in one person and then another person is testifying and then another person is testifying and God's moving them and you can't do that in and of your flesh. You can't do that. And people are getting things that there's no way that they could have gotten there's no way that they could have understood, oh my goodness, this thing that the world has been calling depression is actually godly grief. That's what I'm feeling. I knew it wasn't depression. I knew it was something else. God's moving me. And then another person, oh my goodness, God is moving me too. Someone who talked to me about it after the group, actually. God's moving me too. He's doing the same thing that she was talking about. You can't make that up. That's evidence of the Holy Spirit. When he starts pouring out and he starts edifying you and you know that that edification could not have come from you and you know that the way that you've been living all your life is suddenly changing and that couldn't have come from you. A curse is going out. A curse is going out into all of the houses. You are a house. All of the houses who swear falsely in his name. Did a curse go out into all the houses on the first Passover of those who were not in him, of those who did not have the seal of the lamb? Well, yeah. So maybe he just might do that on Passover, huh? And remember that Passover is eight days. So don't, don't be looking at one day. 
definitely seems like that's what he's doing. That's what I'm feeling in the spirit. So here's what Connie shared with me. And I actually shared with you. It's a very funny because she shared with me two Jeremiah chapters. And do you remember that? Maybe you remember, maybe, maybe you didn't catch those videos, but God has been having me read from Jeremiah. He's been putting Jeremiah on me pretty heavily and telling me that something's building up. And I told you that when I was reading Jeremiah, because I just said, basically, I had been in a lot of grief and I just started reading from Jeremiah because I didn't know what else to do from, with myself and God was putting it on me. So I just took you along. And so Connie calls me today with two Jeremiah verses. Go figure. Jeremiah 9. Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. Oh, that I had in the desert a lodging place for travelers so that I might leave my people and go away from them. For they are all adulterers, a crowd of unfaithful people. Now think about what that curse of bitter water is. It's being represented in the third trumpet. It is representing the curse of bitter water was when a woman had been excuse me, when a man was, had suspected his wife of being unfaithful, she drank the curse of bitter water. She drank the bitter water that would invoke a curse if she had indeed been unfaithful. Think about what God established adultery in order to help us to understand. All those who swear falsely in his name, who say that they are his wife, but they are not. They are not faithful. They are adulterous wives. And remember what God says about the adulterous wife. You don't accept her back because the land has been defiled. Think about that. We've all been adulterous wives. But at this point, he's not putting up with it anymore. He has sent his witnesses. He has sent those trumpets. And it's time for you to know better. So as you see people falling off, you need to understand what's happening there. They are dying. They're dying in the spirit. God's spirit is going out of them. It's very sad. Those who've been reproved over and over, chosen just to ignore it. No, I've made a lie my refuge. Thank you very much. They're dying. So hang on as tight as you can hang on. And that's interesting because didn't I tell you, I, I am just now reminded that he had given me a vision of someone holding on to like a pole, like a lamppost, and the wind was blowing and trying to take him away. And I said that to you in a video not that long ago. That that's what I was seeing. And now he's reminding me of it again. And this is what it's about. Hold on as tightly as you can. There's not that much time left, but you're going to have to hold on tight. You're going to have to stand firm in knowing your God. They make ready their tongue like a bow to shoot lies. It is not by truth that they triumph in the land. They go from one sin to another. They do not acknowledge me, declares the Lord. Beware of your friends. I was talking with someone about that today. I hope they're listening to this. Beware of your friends. Do not trust anyone in your clan, for every one of them is a deceiver and every friend a slanderer. You're sitting in groups, okay? Some of you are in Bible studies, small groups, whatever it is that you call it, and there are people who are teaching falsely in his name. They're teaching falsely, telling you not to observe the Day of Atonement because that's already been fulfilled. You know what the Day of Atonement says? He says three times, you do not observe this. You don't withhold from yourself on this day. You are to be cut off from your people. You sitting in a group, where they're teaching things that are false, where they're distorting the words of God, beware of your friends. A little leaven rises the whole lump. Please consider that. Because if there's a gag order on you and you are not allowed to say, hey, this is false. I don't believe that this is true. Let's talk about it and let's come to truth. You don't believe in the sovereignty of God, that he's able to bring truth. If people won't have a dialogue with you about what the truth is, that's because there's no truth in them. There's no discord in God's church. He will bring you to unity if you actually want truth. But if people are married to a false narrative, you need to run. You need to disassociate yourself from them. And if you're not able to do that, you need to check your heart on why. Why is it so hard for you to separate from people who are not speaking the truth? Please hear that. For ev beware of your friends and do not trust anyone in your clan for every one of them is a deceiver and every friend a slanderer. Friend deceives friend and no one speaks the truth. They have taught their tongues to lie. They weary themselves with sinning. You live in the midst of deception and their deceit. They refuse to acknowledge me, declares the Lord. That was one of the things that Connie and I, uh, that stood out to me anyway, as we were reading it in their deceit, they refuse to acknowledge me. And what I believe that he's saying, what I understand that he's saying is these are people who have the appearance of godliness, but deny his power in their deceit. 
They refuse to acknowledge me. So they're speaking the words, oh, Jesus, 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 but they don't acknowledge him in their deceit, in their lie. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty says. See, I will refine and test them for what else can I do because of the sin of my people? Their tongue is a deadly arrow. It speaks deceitfully. With their mouths, they all speak cordially to their neighbors, but in their hearts, they set traps for them. Should I not punish them for this, declares the Lord? Should I not avenge myself on it such a nation as this? I will weep and wail for the mountains and take up a lament concerning the wilderness grasslands. They are desolate and untraveled, and the lowing of cattle is not heard. The birds have all fled and the animals are gone. I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a haunt of jackals, and I will lay waste the towns of Judah so that no one can live there. Who is wise enough to understand this? Who has been instructed by the Lord and can explain it? Why has the land been ruined and laid waste like a desert that no one can cross? Okay, he's been doing this, by the way. He has been doing it. And you should be asking yourself, why is he doing this? What did he establish in his covenant with us? What was the agreement? Why has he laid waste the land? Because of our carbon emissions? Because of our plastic? Or is it because we've spurned the Lord? The Lord said, it is because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them. Well, there you go. It's not your plastics or your carbon emissions. They have not obeyed me or followed my law. Instead, they have followed the stubbornness of their hearts. They have followed the Baals as their ancestors taught them. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. See, I will make this people eat bitter food and drink poisoned water. You hear that? Bitter food and drink poisoned water. Let's read Revelation 8 and let's see what that third trumpet says. The third angel sounded his trumpet and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. Okay, this is the, that trumpet that I've been telling you, this is about to blow. I also told you that something financial was going to happen, didn't I? That I felt that something financial was happening. I told you that before all this stuff, you know, the Silicon Valley bank went under and then another bank went under and then I think there's like three now. And now, you know, everyone has their opinion on YouTube about what's happening with the banks. Don't go withdraw your money. Don't go freak out. If there's something that he reveals to you personally, then that's one thing. Or if he reveals it to me, and I'll, I will let you know. But he's not revealed anything to me. He doesn't have me freaking out. And, you know, when I see that stuff, I kind of go, oh, gosh, that's scary. Should I? That's the first thing you should be doing. Lord, should I be feeding into this? What do you want from me? Okay, that's the difference between freaking out and stockpiling versus staying attuned to him and acknowledging his sovereignty. Because remember, I just cashed out my entire retirement. And so I'm in a position where that's all I got. The next thing would be selling the building. So that's kind of scary, but he's not telling me anything. And so I'm, I'm good with him. I'm trusting him. But I did tell you that something financial was coming down the pike, that I kept feeling that part of it. And that would make a lot of sense because that too would make some of those people who've been, you know, serving, claim to be serving God and they're serving money, that would make them a little bitter, wouldn't it? Here's a little bitter water for you. Anyway, the main thing is, is that curse. That's the main thing. The curse that's going out to the house of everyone who is swearing falsely in his name, all of those adulterers. But I do believe there's a financial component to it. I'm just leaving it at that and I'm watching what's going down because... This is what God told me was going to happen. You're my witness of that. I did say it to you on the video. See, I will make this people eat bitter, bitter food and poisoned water. Excuse me, drink poisoned water. I will scatter them among the nations that neither they nor their ancestors have known, and I will pursue them with the sword until I have made an end of them. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Consider now, call for the wailing women to come and, for the most, and send for the most skillful of men. Let them come quickly and wail over us till our eyes overflow with tears and water streams from our eyelids. The sound of wailing is heard from Zion. How ruined we are. How great is our shame. We must leave our land because our houses are in ruins. I mean, this has been happening, hasn't it? Goodness, I feel so bad for the people and yet God knows what he's doing. Now you women hear the word of the Lord. Open your ears to the words of his mouth. Teach your daughters how to wail. I tell you this all the time. How important is it that we're observing that grief? Teach your daughters how to wail. That's important to God. Teach one another a lament. Death has climbed in through our windows and has entered our fortresses. Does that sound like a curse that's entering their house? Hmm. 
It has removed the children from the streets and the young men from the public squares. Say this is what the Lord declares. Dead bodies will lie like dung on the open field, like cut grain behind the reaper with no one to gather them. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these things, in these I delight, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all who are circumcised only in the flesh. Egypt, Judah, Edom, Ammon, Moab, and all who live in the wilderness in distant places. For all these nations are really uncircumcised, and even the whole house of Israel is uncircumcised in heart. That was a powerful, powerful chapter. Let's go to Jeremiah 23. Now, before we go to Jeremiah 3, there's one thing that I want to say. Be very careful about trying to crack the code on God, okay? I'm not promoting something. What we are doing is very different from cracking the code on God, which is what a lot of people try to do when they're like doing a study and they're like, oh, bitter. Let's look up bitter. All of the, you know, listen, you look up all of the context. I do this with you where I'll say, okay, let's look up all of the context of bitter on the, on the, you know, in the word. But what we're doing is trying to understand God's heart. You need to discern between a, a study that you're doing versus God actually moving you. So you need to pay attention to how is he moving me in this spirit but don't make the mistake, that stumbling block of trying to crack the code on God, okay? Very fine line. And I know that a lot of um, counterfeit Christianity and counterfeit Judaism do that. Please don't do that. Make sure that you are truly hearing from God. Jeremiah 23, woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, okay? Curse going out to all who swear falsely in his name. I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their pasture, where they will, they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord, okay? Has he... Place shepherds over you, the witnesses, the teachers that are, you know, you hear a voice behind you. He says, you're going to know your teachers and you'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. That's why I tell you, you have to receive this from him, whether or not I am from him, whether or not you should be doing the books that I, you know, that I have written. Is this a message from him? Am I one of his shepherds? I'm not afraid to tell you that. I know that it's essential for you to discern that because the things that I'm going to tell you to do are extremely difficult. The things that you're going to be doing are very, very difficult. Living in the heart and spirit is not for the faint of heart, okay? It's very, very challenging because your flesh wants to pull you away. And so when that work becomes challenging, if you've not received it from him, you're going to start thinking, oh, you know, you could blame me all day, but can you blame him? You have to receive that from him. And truly, you can't come back to blame me if you decided to do all of this stuff and you didn't discern it from him first. It's your responsibility to make sure that you're not setting up any idols. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. Okay, don't start thinking that this is talking about his, just talking about when he's born. He has already raised up a righteous branch. But remember that he's also talking about, he's talking about the time within context. A day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day to God. He can look at a thousand years and he can see, he can see in context what's happening within that thousand years. We look at a thousand years and we're like, "Uh, I can only see past, you know, the week before and the week after, (laughs) you know, we don't have that context and perspective. So when you're reading the word, you need to seek to understand God's heart. What is he saying? He will raise up a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. Okay, so he's talking about, uh, he's reigning. Christ doesn't, isn't actually reigning until after the seventh trumpet blows, right? You see that in Revelation. And he's going to do what is right in the land. And in his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in, live in safety. Well, that's not really happening yet. 
So this is pointing forward, okay? This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. So then, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites out of Egypt. But they will say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the descendants of Israel up out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where they had, he had banished them, then they will live in their own land. Okay, obviously pointing forward. Concerning the prophets, my heart is broken within in me. All my bones tremble. I am like a drunken man, like a strong man overcome by wine because of the Lord and his holy words. The land is full of adulterers because of the curse. The land is full of adulterers because of the curse. The land lies parched and the pastures in the wilderness are withered. The prophets follow an evil course and use their power unjustly. Both prophet and priest are godless. Even in my temple, I find their wickedness, declares the Lord. Therefore, their path will become slippery. They will be banished to darkness, and there they will fall. I will bring disaster on them in the year they are punished, declares the Lord. Among the prophets of Samaria, I saw this repulsive thing. They prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. And among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that not one of them turns from their wickedness. They are like Sodom to me. The people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah. All right, what do the evil Jewers do? Not one of them turns from their wickedness. You need to understand that God's prophets are turning people from their wickedness. They are not leading them to understand that the gods are returning. The return of the gods. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. They are leading you into repentance because of your own sin, not because some gods are returning. By the way, that doesn't stand on scripture. It's dumb. It is without knowledge or understanding. And it is enticing to one's flesh to try to figure something out. Crack the code on God. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty says concerning the prophets. I will make them eat bitter food and drink poisoned water. Because from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has spread throughout the land. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. You know, I'm reminded of something, <laughs> something that, you know, God would have me, he would draw me to certain scriptures like early on and he was teaching me how to kind of follow him and what he was showing me in scripture. And he would reveal things to me uh, long ahead of time, right? And then I'd be like frustrated and I would, I would think like, why, why is this taking so long? And my hope would be built up, but then I, I'd be like, why is this taking so long? So I really encourage you to understand, seek to understand God's timeline and his heart and that certain things need to happen. These things are going to happen, but he also waits for us. You know, he waits for us to get it together. He waits for us to read these things and then sees what we're going to do. So don't lean on your own understanding. Don't expect that all of these things are going to happen immediately because remember again, a thousand years are like a day and a day is like a thousand years. God has a thousand year perspective or an eternal perspective, really. We're focused on right now. We're like, well, why would he send me disease? Why would he send me, you know, whatever, whatever? Because he has an eternal perspective. He knows what's good in the long term, in the eternal picture. If he sends you a disease right now and that brings you into him and you circumcise your heart to him, well then... He did what was right, didn't he? He did what was good. He did what he knew was necessary in order to save you in the long run. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say, no harm will come to you. But which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or to hear his word? Who has listened and heard his word? See, the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath, a whirlwind swirling down on the heads of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he fully accomplishes the purposes of his heart. In days to come, you will understand it clearly. I did not send these prophets, yet they have run with their message. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. They have prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, they would have proclaimed my words to my people and would have turned them from their evil ways and from their evil deeds. Okay, what would the prophets have done? Listen again. If they had stood in my counsel, they would have proclaimed my words to my people and would have turned them from their evil ways and their evil deeds. What does a prophet do, you guys? Does a prophet tell you, I had a dream, I had a dream. Like Troy Black, oh, God told me this again, and then he told me that again, and none of it is even meaningful to you. None of it leads you to repentance. None of it leads you to healing. What about Perry Stone, just tickles your ears, 
so that you can what? Stockpile? What does it lead to? These messages don't lead to repentance. They don't lead to turning you from your wicked ways. What is the message God has me preaching that people hate? Because they surely are not flocking to my channel so that I can tell them what they don't want to hear. But what does God use? What's his pattern? Has he ever used a Perry Stone, a Troy Black, or a Jonathan Kahn? Never. Never has he used them. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, declares the Lord. Do not I feel heaven and earth, declares the Lord. I've heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream, I had a dream. There you go, Troy Black. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? They think the dreams they tell one another will make people forget my name, just as their ancestors forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream recount the dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Therefore, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from one another words supposedly from me. Yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues and yet declare the Lord declares. Indeed, I am against those, prophet, those who prophesy false dreams, declares the Lord. They tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lies, yet I did not send or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. So a prophet should benefit the people. Don't misunderstand, not in a soft coddling way all the way to hell, but they should benefit the people by turning them from their wicked ways. When these people or a prophet or a priest asks you, what is the message from the Lord? Say to them, what message? I will forsake you, declares the Lord. If a prophet or a priest or anyone else claims this is a message from the Lord, I will punish them and their household. This is what each of you keep saying to your friends and other Israelites. What is the Lord answer? What is the Lord's answer? Or what has the Lord spoken? But you must not mention a message from the Lord again, because each one's words becomes their own message. So you distort the words of the living God, the Lord God Almighty, excuse me, the Lord Almighty, our God. This is what you keep saying to a prophet. What is the Lord's answer to you? Or what has the Lord spoken? Although you claim this is a message from the Lord, this is what the Lord says. You use the words, this is a message from the Lord, even though I told you, you must not claim this is a message from the Lord. Therefore, I will surely forget you and cast you out of my presence along with the city I gave to you and your ancestors. I will bring on you everlasting disgrace, everlasting shame that will not be forgotten. Okay, now in Lamentations 3.15, it says, He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunken with wormwood. Okay, remember that wormwood is that bitter substance that is turning, you know, in trumpet number three, turning the waters bitter. So he hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunken with wormwood. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel and st gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot forget prosperity. Okay. That sounds like very similar to what Saul went through. Saul no longer had his peace because you know where peace comes from? God is the spirit of peace. So you have to be filled with God in order to be filled with his peace. You can't have it apart from God. So this person is saying that he hath covered him with ashes, which stands for grief, right? That's what people did when they were grieving, sackcloth and ashes. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forget prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall. And lastly, in Amos 5, 7, ye who turn judgment to wormwood and leave off righteousness in the earth, seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion and turneth the shadow of death into the morning and maketh the day dark with the night that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name that strengtheneth the spoiled against the strong so that the spoiled shall come against the fortress. They hate him that rebuketh in the gate and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. For as much therefore as your treading is upon the poor and ye take from him the burdens of wheat, ye have built houses of hewn stone, but ye shall not dwell in them. Ye have planted pleasant vineyards, but ye shall not drink wine of them. 
For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just, they take a bribe, and they turn aside the poor in the gate from their right. Therefore the prudent shall keep silence in that time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil that ye may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord, God of hosts, will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord saith thus, Wailing shall be in all the streets, and they shall say in all the highways, Alas, alas, and they shall call the husband man to mourning, and such are the skillful of lamentation to wailing. And in all the vineyards shall be wailing, for I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion, and a bear met him, or went into the house and learnt, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Okay, so what is he? What's the picture that he's depicting here? Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. And then you see this other imagery of this person who is, as if a man did flee from a lion, and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. He's just very lackadaisical, right? Leaning on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. Ha, okay. Bethel, Hillsong, false praise and worship, the rock show, all your Christmas carols. I don't even know how to find, you know, I go even on Acapeldridge, you know, that was a channel that I had mentioned previously where I appreciate he sings a lot of old hymns and stuff like that, but he also sings Christmas songs. And sometimes I'm like listening to a song and I'm like, that's not true. Come on. It's so grievous to me. How are you singing worship songs to God? And they're not even true. How does he not convict you in your spirit that that's wrong? You hear what he says? Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials, but let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness for 40 years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Chayun, your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Something is coming, and I'm not the only one testifying to it, right? There's a picture that's being put together, and it's being put together in the body. In the body that we have in our Bible study, in our workshops, and everyone is coming together, and they're testifying to it, and God is speaking to them individually so that when we come together... That picture is coming together. The understanding, just like what happened in the early days of the church, each person with their gifts, each standing at their post, each receiving from God individually. It's very important that that happen. It doesn't take away from my thunder because this is not my thunder. This is God. This is God's thunder. This is his glory to bring his people together. That's what happens when he brings his people together, okay? Not the baloney that's going on on TV, that's going on on CBN with these counterfeit revivals, whatever revival is, because it's not in the word. God's church has always been sort of underground. It hasn't been out there in the open. It's always been a church that's been persecuted. It's always been a church that is not showy of the world. Always been a people who have not been liked by the world, who have been killed by the world. So please use discernment. Please pray with him, pray to him and ask him, to talk with you about these things. Thank you for listening. God bless you, and I'll see you in the next video.